Well, welcome everybody to this uh, month's roundtable discussion. This month we're talking on passing the baton or passing the baton. I don't know how to pronounce it properly, but those are probably both correct. <laughs> So um, for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm Belinda Chaplin. I'm here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, and I'm originally from South Africa, so that's the accent. And we've got three wonderful people with us today. We've got Helen Hess, who's originally from Switzerland, but is in uh, with Weibam in Poland. Mark, who is British, but works in um, Weibam in Panama. And Renier, who's with us from Italy, but he is originally from the Netherlands. So welcome, guys. I'm glad we could have morning. this discussion. Yeah, Mark's in the morning, we're in the afternoon. Yes, <laughs> um, and for those of you that don't know, Mark is our behind the scenes guy who does the website for us at the ELC. So we're very, very happy that you could be with us in front of the scenes today. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Mark. Um, mm -hmm. Just maybe share some of the things that you uh, got out of this month's um, content. Yeah, thank you. Um, I particularly enjoyed um, listening to Carolyn and one of the points that she makes very clearly there um, is the value of the generations. Um, her verse, if you remember, talks about how Paul is saying to Timothy, make sure you find others with whom you can entrust what you have learned so that they in turn can pass on to others. And so we've got we've got Paul, Timothy, others who can then we've got four generations in a single sentence. And the value of that, the value of mentoring, I think, is something which um, cannot be overstated, particularly for movements like ours. People are not paid. People are not employed. People are not here for a, a job, as it were. We have a calling. We have a vocation to be missionaries. And so mentoring is our mechanism for the development and encouragement, particularly of leaders. And and I I have only ever had positive experiences when leadership has been handed on in that environment. Um, and and I'm interested to know, uh, I was part of YWAM England for a number of years. I was responsible for the Harbinden base, the Oval, uh, before moving on to Wales uh, for 20 years. Um, I've had both positive and negative experiences of seeing the baton passed on with and without mentoring. So I wanted to emphasize that as something that really stood out to me, Belinda. <clears throat> That's great. Thanks, Mark. Um, Helen, you, you you also mentioned something about that, and maybe you can share some of the other insights you got this month. Yeah, yeah, I gladly do that. Well, we won't already introduce you. I'm Helen, and I actually, I think amongst us, I'm the oldest YWAM in this group. <laughs> I've been actually 40 years with YWAM, so it's a long time. Yeah, thank you. And I think I had several of those buttons in my hands over these 40 years, you know. But um. I think one thing which uh, which kind of stood out to me and uh, um, yeah, I would like to mention is kind of connection between what Caroline said and Rune wrote. And one thing she said is um, towards the end of, of her um, of the video, she said that uh, when we pass on this button, um, it doesn't mean that we do not run anymore, that we still have a lot of loops to run. And uh, and I think sometimes the challenge, you know, of, of a leader having struggles to give her to the button is kind of this, he forgets that there is there are still loops for him to run. And I think it's connected also with this thought which Rune gave that we actually pass on the button, but it doesn't mean we pass on our calling. And that our calling is really with us to the end of our lives. We all know that, you know, and that we have a race to run till to the finish line. And that, um, you know, that this button giving further is not connected to our calling. It's just an, a next season we are entering and we probably get another button into our hands. You know, yeah. Oh, that's really, really good. And it, it was encouraging to me as well, because, you know, if you're, if you're having to pass it on, sometimes it's something so dear to you yeah. and you don't really want mm -hmm. to give it up but actually uh it doesn't mean you, you you're not uh, carrying on running around in the race you have to run the race to the end so that was a very good analogy on that uh, video yeah definitely mm -hmm. Renier, you had some really good insights as well from this month's resources uh thank you um yeah, there was so much great stuff in there, just in uh, in the different videos, also the articles. And I was commenting specifically on what Runa wrote. <laughs> Sorry, my throat. 
um, how he was making the comparison with leadership and parenting. Being a dad uh, myself of four kids, I think that's a comparison that I use sometimes. And I was just saying earlier, I remember one day, I, I, don't, I don't remember if I heard this directly from Alejandro Rodriguez, I think, or someone quoting him, but the conversation was more or less like this. And I know it's his quote, but he said, you know, that you know that leaders, we talk a lot about passing on DNA, not just passing on the baton, but also DNA in YWAM. And he said, did you know that leaders don't pass on DNA? And it was one of those comments that when I first heard it, it, it I think it almost offended me a little bit because I was like, that's what I'm trying to do. That's what we're, that's what I'm in it for. And he was poking a little bit more and he said, no, 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 it, it doesn't work like that. So I was like, what are you talking about? You got it wrong. And he said, fathers and mothers do. And of course, the moment he said that, it made mm -hmm. so much sense. Um, so I love that comparison that that really also, uh, I think Carolyn was talking about one of her reflections. She was asking all kinds of people for feedback. And she said one of the things that comes up a lot is that in the people that she mentors, that they're saying there's a lack of spiritual parenting uh, mm -hmm. with biological parents, but also in the church, in, in the body of Christ. And so his comparison with parenting, I think, is uh, really powerful. And then I love the example that he said there's no right time for for transitions, uh, that you can't have a right time even for leadership growth in that sense. And the comparison that he makes with, I think you mentioned, you know, a baby starting to crawl, which was very relevant because just last night we had some friends over with a nine month old baby and some people had, you know, made some comments like, oh, they're not crawling yet. And I remember those because we have four kids and we went through those. And and uh, one other parent says like, oh, my, my baby was crawling at that time. And another parent says, oh, your kids are so fast. And comparison is just not very helpful with that. In fact, our oldest daughter, she she never crawled. She just went straight from sitting on her butt and she scooted a little bit like this <laughs> to walking. And the point that he was making, Runa was, you know, saying there is no right time. There's no clock that we can set to, okay, now you're ready for the next step because it's so personal. It depends on so many elements, uh, the community, the people around it, you know, and it's pretty typical for an oldest child, apparently, to start with those steps a little bit later because they have more hands to be carried around and to be passed from one parent to the next. And so there's so many things that play into that. And, uh, and I love that picture that there's no right time because it gives us grace mm. and we can say like, okay, maybe, maybe it wasn't perfect. Someone else mentioned that. I think it was, uh, Judy. And, uh, she said, it, you know, it maybe it doesn't have to be perfect mm -hmm. because it gives us the grace to go like, okay, mistakes can be made as long as we are really quick to repent and quick to forgive mm -hmm. and we prioritize relationship, possibly over results. <laughs> yeah. And we prioritize even the people over the process. And of course, the process is important, but uh, prioritizing really just hearing each other, making time for each other, committing to relationship over results. No, that's exactly yeah. That's exactly right. I love I love what Judy said about when someone asked her how you know was asked how to do trans transition and she and they said very carefully, <laughs> and that's yeah. exactly the timing you need to kind of process. You know, the everything needs to be done well, but just yeah, there's no there's once you've started the process, it's very difficult to kind of stop it. Um, mm -hmm. and I like what she added. She said very carefully, and I and she said and I would add very prayerfully, and I think that's the key starting with God, starting the process with, 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 yeah, just soaking it in prayer. Um, and I think that that's, that's the key with, with all of these transitions. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to go back to some of what you were saying, Mark, about the mentoring, um, mm -hmm. and your, your sort of, um, uh, experience where, when it worked well, uh, mm -hmm. in a mentoring environment, um, maybe you could just speak to, more to that, um, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can. It was it was something I'd never experienced before coming into YWAM properly. There was this whole sort of experience of having someone saying, hey, I see something in you, I'm calling it forth, but they're not in an environment where they're like my boss or they pay my wages or something. And I think, so having that experience where somebody who was just for me, who saw things in me and, and summoned them forth was, was really novel. And one of the things that, I didn't realize at the time, and, and this was alluded to in, in one of the um, one of the contributions, was 
sometimes people see in you stuff that you don't see yet mm. so there was the example of that person who uh they'd known for two years that they were going to be the person that succeeded them but they didn't say that straight away because the person wasn't ready to hear it um, but when the time came the person had grown up in that two-year mentoring relationship and had had an experience which brought them forth into it well and I think for me when I was working in Harpenden it was the last thing on my mind to want to be involved in face leadership I had my own sort of agenda but because I had loving and I'll be quite honest with you quite provoking and frank leaders who were not afraid to tell me the truth in love um, but yet who also were for me and loved me when the time came to take some responsibility and leadership there, I found myself wanting to do that in the environment of having somebody who had my back. And, and here's the thing. They, they also moved slightly out of the way. So it, instead of it doing this with the person over me, they moved sideways and became a sort of a sideways cheerleader. And again, I'd never experienced something like that. I always imagined everyone just sort of went up a notch and everyone followed. And when this person got out of the way and made some room for me, the honor that I felt um, in my spirit, I didn't have language to describe it, I was in my twenties, but, but the honor that I felt as I looked back on it was very profound. And it gave me an environment in which to try new things. And it worked very nicely. And I have always tried to ensure that mentoring is part of my life, whether I am being mentored, whether I'm with others who are being mentored, or whether God gives me the opportunity to mentor others, mm -hmm. this sort of constellation model of mentoring. And I think for YWAM, if that's functioning well, it gives an opportunity for the people around, let's pick the existing leader, who might need to move out of the way. There's an environment in which that can happen. Paul himself, was able to move out of the way to allow Timothy to come up. But Timothy was not without his struggles. He was young and people looked down on him and there were one or two other things in his life. But Paul became his sort of greatest cheerleader. And so I think mentoring is a is an extremely powerful way of protecting the, the baton passing process. Mm -hmm. so that's really good. Yeah. I like that. Um, I think we haven't really touched on um Steve's uh Steve Mayer. He wrote on the pros and cons of of term limits so when someone's sitting in a position and they're not getting out of the way sometimes we think maybe we should have had a term limit on this person's leadership <laughs> um and uh but yeah so there's the pros of that and that they will have to move on but there were also cons uh where like i think um helen you 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 touched on earlier about not people not having that institutional knowledge passed along so maybe you want to talk a little bit about that Helen like just what what is important when the transition is happening how to do that well you mean to do the passing on well yes. yeah and that and that passing on of the of the history and the knowledge yeah oh okay yeah 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 I yeah I I really also enjoyed what Judy wrote actually I I, I just maybe just another thing just shortly beforehand what I really That's enjoyed funny. also how how uh, when she shared that story about that leadership team meeting for a long time and processing and then also almost being ready to give it further but then one of the leaders I think it was the main one just had this check inside of him that I don't think it's their time yet and they all were so in tune with with one another and with God that they stopped and you know I found that was very profound what she shared you know so yeah yeah so I mean what, what I what I would like to just, uh, you know, share is um, kind of in my experience, um, what I sometimes miss um, when this bottle or this leadership is getting further is, um, you know, and, and maybe it's connected also with the strong emphasis in Vivem of hearing God's voice. You know, I mean, it's it's something, it's one of our DNAs, you know, um, that we take the team or the leader, we mentor really back into those uh, those important moments in the past when God spoke mm -hmm. and share it with him and, and share the stories with him. I mean, I, I'm so thankful of having some of those storytellers like Alakimov or others in our mission, you know, who, who tell the story. 
and and take them into their story into this story and share it with them and and excite them what was in the past and then from the past to the present into the future you know and and just really sh you know show him that you know the, we have a god of the past present and future and it's all connected with one another and uh, and sometimes just because we are so a little bit now and hearing now from God, it's sometimes this what God did in the past, which you know it's all connected, kind of gets lost. So yeah, that's that's the one thing. And that was one thing that was a con on Steve's list of just that that passing on of that institutional knowledge. Or if someone goes too quickly, there's no time to do that properly. So that mm -hmm. that was a, a good point that he made, just to make sure that we do pass that on. Um, yeah. Renier, I'm going to call you my uh, champion baton passer because mm. I think you not only had the baton passed to you, you passed it along to someone else in, in Weimar in Amsterdam. So maybe you want to share some insights that you've had from actually practically doing it, how, how it's how it sort of worked out in that. Yeah, I think uh, I can't remember who, but in I think it was in the, one of the videos that someone mentioned oh we can learn from oh, i think judy from other people's experience and uh, what what i like even more is learning from other people other people's mistakes so learn, <laughs> you can uh, you can learn uh, learn from my mistakes <laughs> um no i thinking back of that i i've just felt so honored um uh, actually carolyn is a part of our community in amsterdam Carolyn Ross, and she's been there during that whole transition when she was already there when we arrived and all of our years in Amsterdam. And part of our leadership team, uh, Judy, is Floyd McClung's sister. And uh, so we know also, and just even seeing her face gives me so many amazing memories. And honestly, also one of the challenges, I think, uh, with that is it's both uh, a huge blessing but also challenge to then pick up something that was created long before you. And uh, there definitely is a sense of, you know, or maybe an expectation, unspoken expectation, my expectation, other people's expectations. Yeah. So, uh, trying to fill Floyd McClung's shoes or others that have gone before us that would have been impossible. We were worried about it. It's like we froze a little bit. Are we back? <laughs> yeah, the internet. We're back. We, we hear we, you. We we can hear you. We just have to mention for everyone uh, watching that uh, he's in Italy, and apparently Italy is the, one of the worst nations in the world for internet. So we tried really hard to get good internet, but this is as good as it's going to get. So, <laughs> but I keep going. It was keep going. First, but then everybody froze, yeah. and then I realized it was me. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Just keep going. Mm -hmm. My my apologies for that. So trying to fill someone's shoes is often, I think, more, more of an expectation we put on ourselves than anybody else, really. So true. So, uh, and then, you know, in Amsterdam, we were so blessed to have an amazing team of people. Um, one of the names we mentioned earlier, just before this talk also was uh, Steve Ashworth. And as we were going through that transition, he was there as an interim leader. And one day he came into our leadership meeting and he said, uh, you know, God spoke to me quite clearly. And he said, I'm just I'm just here to help the next generation into the saddle. And I just felt so honored to be a part of a movement where that really is the attitude and the heart of, you know, the, the generations lifting each other up, cheering each other on. And yes, we talk about championing young people, but really uh, one of our leaders in Amsterdam also, uh, Jim uh, Jim Mellis, he challenged us one time because sometimes servant leadership is a little bit uh, abused, I think as well, the term, <laughs> or misunderstood. And he said, really, it isn't just about servant leadership, but he, he said, we're all, we're serving one another. <laughs> and so sometimes the understanding can then be oh the leader is just serving everybody but no we're we're all serving each other and that's really just an amazing uh, thing to see and witness and uh, uh, so in Amsterdam that was uh, quite a beautiful process having people like Carolyn Ross and Steve Ashworth and so many others around to to say here we are just you know lean into us as we help you move forward and of course they have all kinds of opinions and thoughts about where that should go but there's been so much room to then Make make it your own and find your own shoes and and mental and calling, 
and uh, and then we've been a part of a transition of of passing it on as well, indeed. In fact, from the moment we were commissioned as the new base leaders in Amsterdam, we do have a, uh, a beautiful picture of Steve handing me the baton. Oh, like wow. This. Oh, oh, brilliant. <laughs> I love it. I should have actually worked that up. I didn't thought oh, of it now. Oh. So that's... Uh, <laughs> It was a beautiful moment of uh, of just honoring the different generations of leadership as well, and speaking faith into future generations. And um, yeah, it's it's amazing to also then see that passed on even to you know new leadership in Amsterdam at this moment. Uh, you you commented also on uh, Steve uh, Steve Mayer's article. Yeah. And uh, and I was just thinking about a few thoughts about that. I do think. It's obviously there's a little bit more technical terminology in there, and uh, but I do think it's something that uh, that challenges us and needs to challenge us. And it made me think of a comment I once heard from I think Marcus Stefan. He said, you know, it's when you go to a family and you ask someone, show me your family, they're not going to grab uh, a marriage certificate, but they're going to grab a family photo. But the marriage certificate is there because that's the inter- institution. But it's there to support the family, but the family really is about relationship. But you need the institutionalized aspects to actually build a level of trust and foundation for those relationships. And I, so I do think sometimes it's not necessarily our greatest strength in YRAM to understand our the, the institutional aspects, but we need that as a foundation to be relational and to build that level of trust and, and understanding and making sure that we literally are on the same page. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and within that, even, even what he said about uh, the five-year term, um, that challenges me because I need to talk to our team about this. In, uh, in this later, oh, we just started spring. I was going to say in the spring, but this spring in May, it will be five years that we arrived in Italy. Uh, and so you said uh, five years uh, is a good term. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, uh, he also and, said uh, that ten years is I is is the longest. So you can be five mm-hmm. years and then double it. So don't don't just think five years. <laughs> yeah, don't do but that. He's saying yeah. he's saying <laughs> no, ten no, years no, is no. a good is a good length of time for a leader to really get into a job and yeah. move along. So don't don't get out of it that way. <laughs> and I wonder if I could interject something there, yeah. actually, for Linda. Yeah, but, um, please, Mark. Because yeah. um, in the mid-90s in England, in Wild of England, we were in the privileged position of having a large number of staff and we were growing and our, we just had operating locations coming, you know, coming up and so on. But we were reaching the point where a number of leaders had sort of hit the ceiling and there wasn't anywhere else for them to go to. And this actually mm. created a bit of a crisis in our in our relationally sort of based operations because they didn't know where to go. And yet, as Helen pointed out earlier, referencing the resources, they had many more loops to go. Mm. And actually, it was it was a tough moment because they wanted to get out of the way, but they didn't know where to go. Mm. And it wasn't that they were intentionally holding others back, but that actually was the net result. Because they were occupying these positions, nobody could take on new responsibilities. And we ended up having to ask the Lord about it. And for the first time in Wyoming, England, at least, this term of elder began to come up. And we really tried hard to to honour that word of the Lord to us. And the amazing thing was, was that I think in particularly in my mind as a sort of 20, 30 year old, an elder to me was this sort of old person who sort of flitted around the edges and kind of docked in with the odd wise word and then sort of returned to retirement. And and it really halted the mission in England because we just that's what we thought until we realized that actually eldership is not retiring somewhere in the corner with slippers and a pipe. And you know what we get with our elders now was the opportunity for them to do new things that take the whole mission further nice. and higher. And I won't mention names, but there are certain ministries now that are genuinely global that came out of that honoring of a guy. I remember one guy who was in tears and he was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And now that guy leads a global ministry, but from the position of eldership. So for me, that really steadied my heart that it's okay when you sort of reach the top of what you do in your national frameworks. There is always something more to do and not to be afraid of this word elder. It doesn't mean 
retired gray hair it means that you have wisdom to be able to inject back into the if you like the structural which steve references very clearly but yet still have your opportunity to do new labs exactly mm. or you could do what renier did and move to a completely new country and pioneer something <laughs> you know <laughs> so <laughs> There's that opportunity as well, yeah. um, but I like that. Exactly. I like that idea yeah, of the old, elders not being with a pipe sitting on a bench somewhere. Um, I always <laughs> think of Al Akamov, who you know he's got the torch in his hand. He's got the video saying, you know, you can take this out of my cold dead hand. Basically, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm going to carry on being, you know, running the race until I die. So I think mm -hmm. as as uh, as why we might be used with the mission, but our elders are able to do so much um, and we actually need to recognize that as well that mm -hmm. it's not just about um uh yeah the the, the handing off the the bat baton to the younger people means that the the elders are now sitting back and doing nothing does anyone have yeah. any maybe some last words before we conclude i know it's coming to an end can you believe it well i, I do love that picture of passing on the baton and i think we you first hear about it, it's, it kind of does sound like you're just handing something over so that you're done. But Carolyn really brought it back to, I think the word she used a couple of times was interconnectedness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then she said, the interconnectedness of the team defines the success of the whole team. Something along those lines. So the moment you pass on the baton, you're not out of the race. Maybe there's a different pace. Maybe there's a different responsibility, mm -hmm. but we're still running the race. Mm -hmm. And we're still as much a part of the team as while we hold on to the baton, yeah. just in a different capacity, in a different responsibility, different role. But that doesn't define whether we're in or not. No, exactly. And we're I, I on love board, what, we're in it, we're together. I love what Mark said earlier about the leader actually kind of going sideways out of the way. And I thought that was a wonderful, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's he's not running up or, uh, or forward. He's actually going, just getting out of the way and being in another position, but um, alongside. So that's really good. Um, anyone else maybe before we end off? Yeah, I mean, I just I just really like what both of you, Mark and Rainer, said at the end, you know, the this whole thing that, that with the elders. I am an elder in Central Europe, you know, I'm actually even a legacy elder. I still try to figure out <laughs> We're still trying to figure that, that out too. <laughs> what this all means for me, you know, but but it's important. And it's important to take this eldership up. And and what you said that and you let go in a certain age of of your position doesn't mean it ends you know mm -hmm. and I, it was it's beautiful what you shared i really appreciate i i think and now that this one man has a total new global ministry you know embracing it it's wonderful you know so i think uh, yeah that's great well thank you everybody this has been a very good little uh time thank together you, um i hope uh, everyone who's been watching or listening has enjoyed this and uh We'll see you on the other side. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.